just do the prayer again. Father God, in the name of Jesus, um, I just pray that you would move by your spirit even right now and that you would minister, minister to the people in the mighty name of Jesus, um, what you desire for them to have in this Bible interpretation. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. So, um, and bless the name of the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me. Um, we are doing a free will offering. Um, if you desire to do so, um, you are able to do that. Um, and you all have the, the link in regards to, um, where to sew, or you could just do it on, um, cash app and you all have the cash app. So um, here we have the Bible interpretation class and we're gonna go into um, how to interpret the Bible um, from the beginning. We're gonna start from the beginning. We're gonna start from the middle and we're gonna start from the end. Amen, we're gonna go through the middle, the beginning and the end. And so there's a certain way that um, you do interpret the Bible. There's a certain way that um, you get an idea of what the scriptures say. And so God wants you to understand what the Bible um, really is relating to the people. And just simply put that the Bible is basically a love story, okay? The Bible is a love story. And in this love story, you will find out that, um, that God um, is sharing a love story about his people. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to start with a rundown from beginning to end of the Bible. Um, and the rundown is basically, um, the Bible begins in the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, you will find out that um, God simply takes a group of people and he identifies them um, based on um his love for them and the love of his people started with Adam and Eve. And so with Adam and Eve, we learned out, we learned the story of how God began the earth and he began um, the life with Adam and Eve and he began to choose Adam and Eve. So this is the beginning. Okay. The beginning also talks about once Adam and Eve are born um, and God begins to use them, that people began to grow into the earth. And then what God does is he creates an environment where the people become his people. And so the people began to multiply. And then when the people began to multiply, you're still in the beginning of basically the book of Genesis. As the people began to multiply, um, God begins to establish what is called an agreement with them that basically that they're going to worship him um, and in them worshiping him we find out that um, they're able to um, develop a relationship with God, amen? And so um, in that, we find out that um, the Bible says that um, we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth, the Bible also says in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, excuse me, actually 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So what we understand here is that um, God gave scriptures in the beginning of the Bible. And the reason that those scriptures are there the, is, is so that... Um, we can have doctrine, we can have um, correction, and we can have simply an understanding. I'll come back to this to this slide, but I wanna go on to the next one. So what we find out here is that we have, Genesis gives us the creation. Um, and so Genesis talks about the beginning, it talks about um, kind of like the middle, um, but when we get to the middle of the Bible, then we're talking about um, the New Testament, okay? So we're talking about the beginning, the middle, and the end. So you have the Old Testament, which is um, includes 
the, the creation of Adam and Eve. It includes all of the people that God created a promise and a covenant with. Um, it includes all of his, um, his promises for the people that he created. Um, and then once we get out of the Old Testament, then we go into the New Testament. This is the middle of the Bible, okay? And so in the middle of the Bible, we learn about Jesus. This is where Jesus comes in. And once Jesus comes in, he takes us into a place called grace. And after he takes us into, the, into grace, he takes us into the present, which is basically the ecclesia. Here where we have the present is the ecclesia. This is the church. And then he takes us into what is called the future. So in the Bible, you have the Old Testament, the New Testament, you have the past, which is when Christ came because they were looking for a Messiah to come to take away all of their trials and all of their tribulations. And then you have the present, amen. That includes me and you and all the other body of Christ in the world. And then after that, we have what is called the future, which has not happened yet. And so what I want to do is I'm going to go back to the um the the beginning of these um of the PowerPoint here. And so we have the beginning, the middle, the end, and then the summary um, of how to interpret the Bible. But also the Bible is broken into the beginning, the middle, and then also the end. Amen. And so uh, if you have any questions, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to type the questions into the chat and I will be answering questions, but I might kind of save them. Um, I might not answer them right away, but I will be able to save them. So the first thing that we have to understand is the purpose of the scriptures, the purpose of the Bible um, is according to second Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse, please make sure you bring your Bible as well as a notepad so that you could take any type of notes. So the reason and the purpose for the scripture is so that um, our lives can be profitable. Amen. God wants profitability um, in our lives. I believe that we're going to spend maybe an hour together today, maybe even an hour and a half. So we're recording so you can even go back and be able to go over it again. So the purpose and the reason for the Bible is so that we can have doctrine, uh, we can have reproof, and we can also have correction. Um, that word uh, reproof basically means, I'm going to pull that word up um, so that we have a clear understanding of what that word means, reproof. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, when the Bible talks about reproof, it's basically talking about, um, it, it, it's talking about um, um, advisement. Amen. Advisement. It says reproof, an expression of blame or dis disapproval. So that word reproof means that uh, we may be going in the wrong way um, of our lives, but the scripture will bring us back on track. Uh, one scripture that I really like is seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things shall be added unto you. Basically, what that means is that uh, when you when you seek the kingdom of heaven, that um, you seek his kingdom first and then all of these things shall be added unto you. So um, that is the reason and the purpose of um, the scriptures so that we're, we have a guideline. That's what scriptures are for um, They're there so that we have a guideline so that we have a um a, a map or a track in our lives. Amen. And so that's what the Bible interpretation class is going to do for us. It's going to give our, us an understanding of the scriptures. So where we're going to begin on a day is we're going to begin in the beginning. Amen. And so you might not see me a lot. You might pretty much just see um, a lot of the, um, the, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, I don't, I don't know how to um, share my screen so that you could see me and the PowerPoint. I hope that that's working, but we're going to try to go ahead and do this. So um, in the PowerPoint, um, we'll find out that um, the beginning um, is a place of Genesis. Okay. So in Genesis, we find out that God is dealing with a group of people. And in the group of people, um, the first one he begins to deal with 
is he begins to deal with Adam and Eve. Amen. And so in dealing with Adam and Eve, uh, the Bible says that, um, that um, God created Adam and Eve. He created them uh, for a reason and he created them for a purpose. We know that God created the earth. All right. And so in God creating the earth, he also created the people to live in the earth. Amen. So we find this in Genesis, the first chapter going through the sixth verse. And so then uh, we find out that um, the Bible says that when God created Adam and Eve, uh, we'll go over to Genesis, the second chapter, and we're going to begin reading at, um, let's see here. Um, I want to begin reading at verse 19. The Bible says, and out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Um, I'm going to do something here. Give me one second. Um, give me one second here. I want to bring this up. All right. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now, this right here is just simply my system of um, scriptures. Okay. So um, I'm going to bring this up here for you. So in the book of Genesis, if we would go to um, this here second chapter, and I was begin read, beginning to read at the 19th verse, this right here is called, um, this right here is called Eastward. And I want you to write that down. Eastward is a, a app. Uh, that gives you the Bible and it gives you everything about the Bible and it just gives you everything. Okay? Amen. Um, it gives you um, all of the um, commentary. Um, it just gives, gives you an explanation of everything. All right. And so as we learn here in Genesis, the 19th chapter, excuse me, Genesis, the second chapter and the 19th verse, I believe we're right here. Um, the Bible says, um, let's see, no, I got Genesis. I got the wrong scripture up here. Uh, give me one second here. Um, I want to go back. Let's see here. Genesis, the second chapter. And I want to read the 19th verse is where I am. And so here we find out that God created um, the man. So here the scripture says, and out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the, air, of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name of the creature. The Bible says that, um, at, that the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. This word instead here, that means um, in place, all right? So um, eastward is so good because you could click on one word and it could tell you what it meant, what it means. So it means in place, all right? So um, that means that he did something in place of, all right? So he caused a deep sleep to call come up on Adam. And once he caused a deep sleep to come up on Adam, the Bible says that, um, he took from the man and he made a woman and brought her unto the man. All right. Um, yeah. Eastward. That's it. Yes. Eastward. Um, yes, that is Eastward. All right. So he caused the deep sleep to fall up on Adam. And once he caused the deep sleep to call up, fall up on Adam, he took the bones of the woman, all right? And he made her with Adam. Now, I pray that you all can see my screen. Can you see my Eastward screen? I just want to make sure you could see my Eastward screen. I'm not really familiar with Zoom, so uh, please just bear with me and give me a chance. Yes, all right. So you can see the screen. All right, sounds good. Okay, so here we find out that... Um, the Lord took the man and, and opened him up and he created the woman. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how God created one man? Um, and the Bible declares that because God created um, the woman from the man, that man pretty much has dominion over the earth, but God created both the man and the woman, all right? And so 
The Bible says, and he and Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I've heard people say that the reason why they call her woman is because they say, whoa, man, look at that woman. Whoa, man. Amen. Hallelujah. And so I'm hearing that song. She's a bad man, Madama. Amen. And so the Bible says there shall a man uh, leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the one and the two shall become one flesh. That's in Genesis 2 and 24. All right. So we find out that the man and the woman were created and they both were naked. The Bible says, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. All right. So then what happens is um, God gave them an instruction. Amen. And we find this in the third chapter of Genesis. When God gave the man and the woman an instruction, he told them, um, not to eat of any other tree, amen, which is in the garden. And we find this, amen, um, a, more so towards the second chapter, the first chapter, um, where God had created Adam and Eve. But there was something that was also created called the serpent, amen. And when the serpent was created, the Bible says that God, that God, um, that God, um, jolted the serpent down to the earth. Amen. Um, the Bible says that um, God kicked him out of heaven. There was no more place for the serpent to um, to have in, in heaven. Amen. And so that's how the enemy got down on the earth. If you've been wondering about that, um, how did the enemy get down to the earth? That is how. Amen. Um, the Bible says that there was a war that broke out in heaven. Amen. And so the angels fought, amen. The good angels fought with the bad angels. Um, we find this in Revelations, the 12th chapter and the seventh verse. The Bible says here, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Listen at this, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The Bible says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. Look at that. It says he was cast out. Where does that say? Into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So now here we are in a place where we live. You might want to mark that in your Bible. You can go back and, and read it. Amen. Uh, Revelation is giving you... A, a revelation of what happened before Genesis. Yeah, the Bible is so deep, um, but it actually, it's the end, it's the end chapter of the Bible. Um, but it gives you an understanding of what happened before then, amen. And so um, Satan was thrown down into the earth. I believe that this is the time in which there were um, dinosaurs, okay? because there's no way that um, man could live on the earth with dinosaurs, all right? I believe that this is the time, and I believe that Satan was there a very long time before man came, but I do believe that the earth had already been created. So in, qu in case people have that question, um, that, is a, that is a theology um, that we can share. Let me tell you again, I believe that God created the earth, the Bible says that God created the earth um, in Genesis 1. Um, the Bible says that God created the earth. So we find here in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. That means that it was black. It says, and darkness was up on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved on the waters. All right. And so he brought waters. He said, let there be light. But I believe that um, there was a time in which after he created the earth, that he threw Satan, here we are in Revelations here, that he threw Satan down into the earth because Satan no longer could live inside of heaven uh, because he got out of his um, obedient, obedience place, okay? And then after Satan was thrown into the earth, I believe that millions and millions of millions of years went by and then we find out that God created the man, all right? Um, this is just simply what I think, amen, here. Um, I believe that God created the man 
to show the enemy that you're not going to win. Amen. So I believe that there was a war already in place when we got here. All right. So um, we find out that God created the man. And so if we were to go back to Genesis, I believe that we're in the third chapter. So how is it that the Bible says now the serpent was more subtle. I'm in Genesis three and one was more subtle than any other beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. You know, how is it that he was already here? Amen. And he was able to talk to Eve. And the Bible says, and he said unto the woman, um, yea, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, I'm in Genesis three and three, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So we understand that the spirit of death was already up on the earth. That look at that word die right there excuse me, what we're understanding is that God had already created an environment where things could die, amen? The Bible says, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. It says, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Now let's stop right there in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray even right now, God, that these people would have an understanding. I ask that you would open up their eyes even right now that they would understand what this means. Now, when we look at this word evil, this word is talking basically about, um, I want to say, uh, when we look at the word evil, this word is basically talking about uh, sin. All right. Um, let me bring this over here. Um you know, evil does not have to mean like wicked witch of the West, all right? Evil is just simply what the enemy has, bad qualities, bad morale, bad thoughts, um, distress. Um, it says here, let's see, producing sorrow, unhappy, amen? So unfortunate, number three. So Satan and Satan was able to put into the mind of God's creation and God's people sadness. He was able to put into the minds of the people uh, not only sadness, but also he was able to put in there um, 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 doubt, okay? Um, this is why we were born, hallelujah, in the mighty name of Jesus. This is why we were already born with the spirit of doubt. And the reason why we are born with the spirit of doubt is because of this, because of verse seven, the eyes of them both were open. The Bible says that uh, they began to know evil. So they began to doubt. And the first thing they began to do is they, they the first emotion that came on them was embarrassment. Because in verse six, it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good, for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and did eat and also gave to her husband. He did eat. The Bible says in verse seven, and the eyes of them both were open and they knew, look at that word knew, and they knew that they were naked. So there was an embarrassment there. There was a shame there. So that's the first emotion, which we call quote unquote evil that, um, that, that, that the people knew about, that they learned their eyes became open to those emotions. And so what Satan did is he was able to open up the eyes of the emotions of the people. Amen. This is why we need scripture. This is why we have to understand that scripture is for what? What did we say scripture was? Scripture was for, according to 2 Timothy um, 3 and 16, it's for inspiration, amen? We need to be inspired because if we're not inspired, then we find out that um, we could go through life and not make it. Okay, this is why a lot of people struggle. Amen. A lot of people struggle because they need to be inspired. Amen. I, I want to get the screen over here um, to you, but um, 
Let's see, I, I, I don't think I'm sharing the right screen here, but that's all right. I, I was trying to scare, share this screen with you right here. Um, the reason why we need, um, the reason why we need um, the scripture is this word right here. Um, 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God for profitability. Why? Because we've learned evil. Amen. And in learning evil, we find out that uh, we've learned, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, what the enemy is able to, um, what the enemy is able to try and do to us. Amen. But when we get into a place where we learn the scriptures and we know what God is saying and we have an understanding of what the scriptures mean and have an understanding of what the scriptures are, are saying, then we can become encouraged. Amen. And so as we go back over to our Bible here, we find out that um, the, the children um, that God created um, had emotions. Amen. They were naked. They were ashamed. They sold fig leaves together. Um, just stay in this little place right here. All right. And so the Bible says that they heard the voice of God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. This is verse eight. The Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you that he can cause you to hear him, that, that man has been hearing God since the beginning of time. All right. Um, man has been hearing God since the beginning of time. The Bible says, then he heard the voice of the Lord. Listen at verse eight. It says, and, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is how you hear God. You hear God through his voice. God speaks. He spoke to Adam. He spoke to Eve. He speaks to me. Amen. You can hear his voice. You can hear him in your heart. The Bible says, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the, before the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Now, I want to take a shift. I hear the Holy Ghost saying to go over to Romans, the fifth chapter, and the mighty name of Jesus. And so in Romans, the fifth chapter, um, I want to introduce to you the Holy Ghost, all right? So we, we talked about Genesis, which is the beginning of man, but now we got to talk about the Holy Ghost a little bit. So here in Romans, the fifth chapter, the fifth, the fifth verse, it says, and hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Now, listen, God is talking about your ability to hear him. All right. Uh, the Holy Ghost causes you to be able to hear God in the place of your heart. Hold on to Romans, the fifth chapter and the fifth verse. And hope make if not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, there are multiple ways that I'm going to go back over to Genesis. There are multiple ways that we can hear from God. We can hear from God through the Holy Ghost. But we can also hear from God through the scriptures because the scriptures speak to us. All right. And so um, in Genesis, the third chapter, I'm going to go down to the 10th verse. The Bible says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. When you hear God, don't be afraid. When you hear God, uh, don't hide yourself because everything is naked before the Lord, okay? Um, there's a reason why you're in this class. You're in this class because God wants you to hear his voice. You're in the Bible interpretation class because God wants you to understand what he's saying to you through his word. There are ways that God speaks. The way that God speaks, now I'm going to just show my voice, show my face here for a minute. Um, the way that God, the way that God speaks is he speaks through, hallelujah, in the mighty name of Jesus. He speaks through his spirit. Amen. He, and when he speaks through his spirit, uh, what he does is he shows you um, the way that um, you should go. Can everybody see me? Type in there if you could see me. 
in the name of Jesus. I don't like how this, how this, um, how this is showing. All right. So, um, oh, okay. We could see you before, but you could, you could see that you could see the, you could see the Bible too, right? I believe you should have been able to see it. Yes, you could. I believe you could. Yes, but all right, good. Thank you. And so uh, what God does is he shows you, uh, well, if you could see me both, then I'm going to go over here. Then uh, what God does is he shows you um, how he wants you to hear him. Amen. So the way that you hear God, again, is through the scripture, through all of this Bible, all these all these over here, um, Genesis, Exodus, you hear God through the scriptures. And then you hear God also in your heart through the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that's where we are at that Romans five and five. Amen. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. All right. So that's how God speaks. A lot of people say, I want to hear from God like you do it. And I want to be in the presence of the Lord. Well, the way you get there is through the scriptures. Amen. Um, God is going to speak to you through the scriptures. The more scripture that you have into you and the more scripture that you read, the more um, you'll be able to hear from God. All right. So we're going back into Genesis, the beginning of a people. Amen. And so what the enemy did is he caused the people to make a mistake. Amen. And the people made a mistake. And isn't it amazing because the people made a mistake that God then also um, show that, um, I can cover your mistake. Amen. I know that you made a mistake, but I can cover your mistake. And in the covering of the mistake, he sent what is called Jesus Christ. And so how do we know this? Um, the Bible declares that, um, down here in Genesis, the 13th chapter and the 13th verse, it says, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. All right. We're in Genesis 3 and 13. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now listen at verse 15. He says, and I will put enmity. This word enmity means hostility. Look at that hatred, um, malice, um, um, enemy. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now look, look at this, her seed. Her seed means Christ, all right? Um, um, her seed means Christ. Hold on to that because... That is so important. When we look at the seed of God, we find out that, um, um, let's see here, uh, where do I want to go with this? I want to get rid of this and I want to look at the seed, amen? Jesus is the seed, all right? So this seed is what the woman produced and the woman is not only Mary, but the woman is the church. Now God is getting ready to go real deep on you, okay? Stay with me, please. Amen. So here we have a situation where all hell broke out on earth, all right? So God says, Satan, because you did this, I kicked you down the earth, but you didn't mess around and messed up what I created, what I love. And because of this, I'm gonna put enmity between you and her. Now, let me show you this. Uh, we're going to find this in, uh, let me see. Um, da, 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 da. I was there last night. Uh, we were in Revelations last night. I want to say the 12th chapter. Um, let's see here. Revelations. I believe that was the 12th chapter uh, where God said that, that um, they um, made war Let's see here, war with, um, yeah, here it is right here. Revelations 12 and seven, see this? It says, and the dragon, which is that devil, was wroth with the woman. So we learn in Genesis that he was mad with that woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's us, all right? 
But there's also something in here that says that um, not only did he make war, but he also persecuted um, the woman. Um, but this is because uh, God created um, enmity between the two. All right. So let's see here. Um, I want to go back over to uh, here it is. Uh, chapter 13. Stay with me. So chapter 13 and the seventh verse, we're learning about, we're learning about the relationship between us and the enemy in Christ. So you have three people, you have the enemy, you have us, and then you have Christ. Remember I said that Christ is the seed. All right. So Revelation is the 13th chapter and the seventh verse says, listen at this. And it was given unto him, which is the enemy to make war with the saints. All right. So if we go back over to Genesis, where we were, which is the third chapter, amen, we were right there. We find out, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, God, that God is issuing out judgment. All right. He told him he was cursed above all cattle. And this verse 15, and I will put um, animosity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. See, her seed is, is Christ, all right? And the woman is the church. Stay with God, amen? The Bible talks about the woman, amen? And the way that he talks about the woman is in Revelation, he's, in Revelation, he talks about the woman because the woman represents the church, all right? Uh, let me see here. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Maybe I'll go over to Revelation 17. It's almost as if I hear God saying to, to try and go over there. I want to show you who the woman is, all right? Um, let's see here. Hallelujah. Uh, here it is here. Uh, hallelujah in the name of Jesus. All right. So the woman we find out is the in, is the church. So I'm going to go down here to the 12th verse. Uh, no, that's not the one that I want, but it says here. Uh, hmm. Let's see here. Okay, it says, and there came one of the seven angels which had a seven vows and talked to me saying, come and I will show thee judgment of the great whore that sit upon many waters. Um, he carried me into the spirit and I saw a woman sit up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. All right, this is where they, this is where the enemy attacked the woman. All right. And the woman represents the church. All right. So let's see here. It says here, and I saw the woman in verse six, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right. So the Bible says that the woman gave forth the man child. All right. So I'm going to put this in here. Um, let's see here. And I want to show you where the Bible says that the woman is basically the church. See, women give birth, all right? And when they give birth, they bring forth a seed and that seed was Christ. But the woman is the church. It's kind of think of it like this, that if you just put, if you just had a woman, right? And she's pregnant and her belly is sitting out there. That woman represents the church. All right. And the church is the one that pushed out or birthed out Christ, which is the seed. So here we find it here in Revelations, the 12th chapter and the 13th verse day with God. It says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. All right. So Eve is a, um, is a sign or a, or a or a um um in symbol or a um 
she's a um she she represents um the woman and the church um ah yeah 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 i hope you get it on a day so you have you have the church which is the woman but then you have eve who represents the birth of all living stay with god all right eve is the eve is the mother of all living amen and so eve is a Eve is a is a is an insignia of the church. Amen. But the woman represents the spirit of Eve. Do you follow me? It says, and he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now, who is the man child? Well, let's go back over to Genesis. The male child is Christ. Because we said that the man is the man child is the seed. All right, so you got the first Adam and then you got the second Adam, which is Christ. So Adam is a replica of Christ. Stay with me. I, I hope I'm hope I'm not losing you. I, I know it's kind of deep. Amen. And so um, as we go down here, we find out that we're still in Genesis 3 and 15. This is so rich and it's so good. It says, and I will put enmity or war between thee and the woman, Genesis 3 and 15 and between thy seed and her seed. All right, so um, I wanna stop and pause right there. I wanna make sure you guys are getting this. Somebody put in the chat, um, I wanna, um, Delicia put in put in the chat who the, who, the, who the seed is. It says between the woman and between her seed. Put in there for me um, who her seed is and then put in there for me who the woman is. Now I'm going to go back over here. Um, can you put that in there for me and tell me? Hallelujah. Okay, Christ. Who is Christ? Christ is who? Woman is the church. All right, you got it. All right. And then Christ is the seed. Put that in there. The seed. All right. We got it. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. This is why it is so important that you have to understand what God does with seed, amen? Seed is so important. You're gonna get a lot of people that complain about giving, but if they could understand um, the, the theology behind seed, then they could understand that God has miracles. My God, in the name of Jesus, God has miracles assigned to their lives, but they don't understand the seed, all right? So now we're gonna go back Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. And I pray that I'm still sharing. Um, I believe that I'm still sharing um, this here. Let's see, make sure that I'm still sharing this uh, with you. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Let me see. Um, I'm not sharing. Okay, she said, I'm not sharing. All right, so let me get this up here and share this with you. All right, you should be able to see it now. In the mighty name of Jesus. All right, so Genesis 3 and 16. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right. This heel represents, okay, the head means that Christ is the head of all principality. It means that Christ is the head of the church. All right. I'm going to take, I'm going to take this up here and I'm going to show you where Christ is the head of all principality, all right? Um, um, principality meaning um, Christ is over all spirits. Hey, Shaba, in the name of Jesus, you better teach this class, God. All right, first, all right, Colossians. This is Colossians, the second chapter. And I'm going to begin reading. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, the seventh verse. I believe y'all learning something on the day. The Bible says, well, I'll just start beginning reading in verse eight. Colossians 2 and 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are all one, Christ. It says, and ye are complete in him, 
which is the head of all, what's that word? Principality. So when we look at the word principality and power, so Satan don't have no power and God is over all principality, okay? So principality represents um, every God. Did you see back there where it said that, um, that, um, that Satan told um, them that they would be like gods? Amen. There are more than one God. There is more than one God in the earth. Amen. Um, you got bad gods. Amen. And so when we learn about other religions, we learn that there are gods. Amen. Um, 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 Satan is a God, but guess what? Christ is over all gods. Now the word God basically means to rule. All right. Um, Satan is, the Bible says that he is the God of this world. Uh, let me show you that on a day. Amen. The Bible says that, um, I hope I'm not, I don't, I don't think I'm confusing y'all. Um, the Bible says that he is the God of this world. Uh, let me see here. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I got, I lost this down here. All right. Um, the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. All right. But we're showing that God is higher than him. And, uh, but Satan doesn't want you to think that. Amen. Um, um, Satan doesn't want you to believe that. Uh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. Amen. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Listen, listen to me on a day. Amen. Um, you got the world and then you got the church. Amen. Satan is over the world. Amen. We know what the world is. Amen. The Bible says that, um, let me see. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Stay with me on a day. Hallelujah. Shaba. Hallelujah. I'm going to see if I can find this. Um, mm, my God, in the name of Jesus. I want to find this. Um, it says Satan, the God of this world. Let me see if I can use my phone. In the name of Jesus. Shaba Rebe Roto Raba Rebe. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Um, let's see here. Stay with me. I'm gonna get the scripture. Hallelujah. Satan is the God of this world. All right, this says Second um, Corinthians. Let's see, this says Second Corinthians. Let's see here, Second Corinthians. And this says the fourth chapter. The Bible says, um, let's see here. No, that's not it. Second Corinthians. What does Second Corinthians? The fourth chapter. Let's see here. Let me see a scripture. Uh oh. Let's see scripture. Hold on. I gotta show you the difference. Let's see here. Saying Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. It says Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, in the first verse. It says, "In whom the God of this world." All right, that's it. I'm sorry. All right, this is it right here. All right, start. I'll start reading at verse three. It says, "But if our gospel be hid, it is hid unto them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not." Now, see that word "God" is a little g. Whenever the Bible talks about um, the enemy or other gods, it says little g, amen. But the big G right here represents God, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so it says, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, amen. So we find out that um, 
that God is saying and showing, if we go back to Genesis, the, uh, let me get rid of this. If we go back to Genesis, the third chapter, then we find out that, um, that there's something that God did between the man and the woman and the church. And so we have this thing called the seed, amen. And so it shall bruise thy head. That's what that means. That head means principality. Um, the Bible says that God is the head of all principality. We learned that. And so it says, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Um, that heel means, um, what that heel means is that means um, um, sin, all right? Um, meaning that, okay, how do I explain this? This is how I explain it. Um, <clears throat> you're saved, right? We know that we're saved. Right. But the Bible says that uh, we're saved, but you've got to be saved from something. Amen. And when you're saved from something, that means that you're saved from hell. All right. So that means that until you cut until Jesus Christ comes, that uh, you still have to, um, I want to say, battle with um with sin. All right. So in our battle with sin, um, God doesn't crush sin until he comes and redeems you, um, as a bride, as the church. Um, let us read this Romans eight. It is says, there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit for the law of the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. So basically what this is saying is that we're, you're, there's a war there. There's a war between Christ and there's a war between the enemy. All right. And the war means that um, Christ is going to completely crush sin. Um, it hasn't been completely crushed because the world hasn't come to an end yet. Uh, when the world comes to an end, then we'll be in a glorious state. We'll be, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible said there'll be a new earth. There will be no more um, sin in the earth. So until then, Satan, Satan is bruising Christ's heel. All right. Um, the Bible says that um, even with, um, uh, Judas, that uh, he lifted up his heel against Christ, all right? Um, let me read a little bit more. It says, for what the law couldn't do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, see that word? And for sin condemns sin in the flesh. But there's still a war there because we're battling in our flesh, but the only thing that God sees in us is his son, Jesus Christ. So while we're battling in our flesh, God don't see our battle. He only sees our, his son. But one day God is going to take the, the battle of our flesh away completely. And that's called a, an incorruptible body. Okay. Um, incorruptible. Um, that means an incorruptible. That means an incorruptible body. All right. I want to bring this. I think this is spelled with an I. That means an incorruptible body. All right. So here in, um, let's see. Um, let's see. This one is good. Mm. First Corinthians, the ninth chapter in the 25th verse says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. All right. So, um, that's good, but let me hit the, hit the nail on the head. All right. Here it is here. The 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 and 15 and 15 and 52. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. This is talking about the end of the world. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortality must put on Im immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swell swallowed up in victory. All right, so what does this mean? All right, let me tell you what this means. This means that, um, that until we get to that point, of glorify that uh, there's a war between Satan and Christ and sin is still there. But at the end of the world, God is going to make us so that we don't look sinful and dirty anymore, but we're going to look uh, clean. All right. And so um, let's see here. There's a, there's a, there is a, um, a situation that happened uh, with Jesus. And the Bible said that um, that Jesus had a uh, well. Let's just go there. Let's see if I let, let's see if I can find it. It's in the it's in the Synoptic Gospels. Let's see here. Ah, uh, uh, my, 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 my. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. Uh, let me find the key word here, which is going to be. Um, ba ma 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 Um, uh, let me see. He said, "Let me build a tabernacle." Hold on, my computer is going so slow. Hallelujah! In the name of Jesus, so I'm able to look this up here. Matthew. Hold on, stay with me. Mm. That's not it. Jesus was transformed. That's what I'm looking for. I gotta find the scripture. Hold on one second. I believe it's in Matthew, but I wanna be for sure. Jesus was transformed. All right. Matthew, the 17th chapter. I'm going to give you an idea of what we're going to look like. Matthew, the 17th chapter and the second verse. Here it is right here. Now listen at this. We're talking about corruptible versus incorruptible. What, what will it look like? We're in a war and we're in the middle and right now, uh, we're still battling with sin. Uh, God gave a fix. He gave Jesus Christ where God doesn't see our sin anymore. He only sees his son, Jesus. But there will come a time where uh, we're going to be completely changed. So it looks like this here, Matthew 17 and 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain and was transfigured before them. See that word transfigured? It says, and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Now before he was just a man, all right? He was a man, he looked like them. He, you, he could, his hand was like them, his blood was like, he was just a regular man. But he took them up on this mountain to show them something. Look, I can turn into something. It's like turning into being invisible. Um, it's like turning into a new body. It's like, and so what he turned into was, um, if you would think of superheroes, um, I, um, um, it's, it's a bad analogy, but if you ever watch the Marvel movies, I love those movies where um, the superhero turns, transfigures into another um, being. Um, they look different, okay? So, Jesus took the took his disciples up on a mountain and said, look, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to turn into something else. And so he turned into um, um, as bright as the sun. Um, and the Bible says in his raiment, 
his raiment mean these clothes um, were as white as the light, all right? And so really what he turned into is he turned into a glorified state. And this is the only thing that can inhabit heaven because it's so pure. And so when we die and God raised us up from the dead in the end day, we're going to learn about that um, in, in the, in, when we talk about the end time of the Bible, um, God raises, God will raise us up into perfection. And this is what it looks like. And so as we read this, it says, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him, then answered Peter and said unto the Lord, Jesus, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good. It is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make for thee a tabernacle, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for, Eli for Elias. It says, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and they were so afraid. All right. Um, does anybody have a question? So far, in the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah. I want to go over here and see. Um, I want to see if, I want to see, um, hallelujah, if anybody has a question. Let's see here about what we talked about so far. Um, I could see a chat here. Um, I say my internet is unstable. All right. Are you there? Okay. Can you go back over the corruptible versus incorruptible? Yes. All right. I know it's a lot. Hallelujah. All right. So let's go back into this. All right. So we're talking about, um, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back over the corruptible versus incorruptible, but I, but I want to go back over here to the enmity. All right. So he said, Genesis 3 and 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. We learn about the head, which is the principality. It is the seed. It's principality shall bruise the head of Satan. Because remember that Satan was the God of this world. But when Christ came, no longer was he the God of this world, that Christ dwells in the earth too. It says, and thou shall bruise his heel. So this heel is talking about um sin all right and so when we learn about sin we learn that um that the way that we are now is that um we're in a in, we're in a corruptible state meaning that Jesus Christ has covered us right and Jesus Christ has covered, her, covered, covered us. We're saved by faith and we're kept by grace, right? So we're in the right standing with God. Let me go over to Romans, the fifth chapter, right? We're, 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 in this, we're in the right standing with God. Look at this Romans five. Let me read this. It says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We're saved. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that the tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. 
But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Now, let me stop right there. There's something that Christ did for us. He saved us. He justified us. Look at verse nine, his blood. Let me make sure I'm sharing this with y'all. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. I'm not even sharing this. Lord have mercy. That's all right. I got it up there now. So I've been reading Romans 5 and 1. Let me go over it again. All right. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of God, the glory of God. And not, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength, that means sin, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All right. Christ died for the ungodly. I hope it's not freezing. It says, for scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. All right. So what this is saying is that um, we're saved. No longer are you in the wrong standing with God, but now you're in the right standing with God and you are saved. And because you're saved, you still struggle with sin. So it's like this. Um, let's say this represents Jesus. All right. And then you got me, which is you. And then you got this back here, which is, um, let's see, this represents God. All right. So um, let me, let me do this over. Let me try this a different way. Can uh, let me see, make sure everybody can see me. I believe y'all could see me. I pray you can in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me see. You said something. Yes. All right. All right. So let me give you this example. All right. Christ is in the middle. Right. And then, um, God is right here, and then I'm right here. So we're you're back here, you're trying to get to God, right? But there's the sin standing in the way. So then what God does is he puts Christ in the middle. So he don't see your sin no more. The only thing that God sees is his son. But Christ has to come back at the end of the world and gather everybody together. And then no longer will you be corruptible. So that's what this is talking about when you put on the incorruptible, which we were talking about in Corinthians. Let me see. Let me get back over here. Hold on. Romans, Genesis. All right. Here it is. Now this first Corinthians, this is talking about the end time. Okay. You do you know somebody who passed away? Just think about them. They're laying in a grave and they're asleep. And when they died, they died 
um, flawed. They believe in Christ. They accepted Christ as their savior, but when they die, they die flawed. But the Bible says that Christ is going to raise them up and he's going to come back and get everybody and no longer will we be flawed, which represents incorruptible, but will we will be corrupt which represents a corruptible, sorry, but we will be incorrupt. So here it says, um, now this I say, brother, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. See, your flesh and your blood can not inherit the kingdom of God because you can't get into heaven the way you are because remember, Satan has made you knowledgeable of good and evil. So no evil can it be accept accepted into heaven. If I picked up this cup, amen, and I got this cup, right? And I take this pen and this pen, look at this pen. It's got scratch marks all over it. It's not even, it's cracked. It's got scratch marks all over it. And I take this pen and I try to put it in this cup. Because this cup is so perfect, it will eject the pen out. The pen can't go in there. This is heaven and this is you. You're corrupted because now you know good and evil. Remember before Adam and Eve, they only knew good. Before they ate of the tree, they, they were innocent. They were pure. God walked with them. But when they ate of the forbidden fruit, now they became cracked. Now we have doubt and fear and anxiety and heaven is so perfect that this cannot go in there, but it will eject it out. That's why Satan got kicked out of heaven because he became um, a liar and he became a manipulator. Those things can't go into heaven. So verse 50 says, first Corinthians 15 and 50 is where we are at. We're at, it says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why a lot of people die in their sins and they don't get saved because they never receive the spirit of God, which is holy and perfect. It says, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. You can't mix the two. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we but we shall be changed. But we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye. The Bible say that Christ is going to come back so fast that as soon as you bat your eyes, he's going to be here. At the last trump, that means the last horn that blows. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Remember I told you to think about a person that died? They died corruptible, but when Christ come back and they raise up, they're going to be incorruptible and they're going to look like Christ did when he took them up on that high mountain and he was transformed. It's a lot in one day. It says he's going to be, they're going to be raised incorruptible and we shall change. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's when you're going to be transfigured, transformed. You're going to be an angel, basically. And this mortality must put on immortality. So until the time comes that you become an angel, Satan is bruising the heel of Christ because we're still battling with sin and we're still battling with the right thoughts. That's why no matter how much good you try to do, it's still not good enough because the only thing that can cover you is Jesus Christ. That's rich. It says in verse 53, this for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortality must put on immortality. See, mortality means death. But no longer will you be dead, you'll live forever. You'll be immortal, eternal, living forever. Isn't that a beautiful thing to know that you're going to live it forever? You're going to get a new body. 
that body you don't worry about that body you're going to get a new body when we go to heaven it says verse 50 54 so when this corruptible shall have but so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortality have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the same that is written death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here where you guys are and I am going to, let's see, you could see me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if you have a question, I am going to take your microphone off and let you ask the question. And then I'm going to be able to answer because we're going to wrap up. All right. So the thing that we've gone over today has been the beginning. All right. And I don't know how we're going to do this in four weeks because this is this is this is something else right here. But this is the beginning. We're talking about interpreting the Bible. All right. So if you have a question, just put in the thing. I have a question. And then I'll take your microphone off and you can ask the question so that I can hear because I know you don't want to type all of that. And then I could be able to answer your question. Amen. Amen. So if you have a question put in there, I have a question. I'm waiting to see who has a question. Amen. So we learned that in the beginning, no question. All right. Um, so we learned that in the beginning, um, let's see here, of Genesis. All right. We learned that, uh, I'm going to go back over here to my PowerPoint. Give me one second here. Um, one minute. Hold on. Wrapping up. So here we learn the creation is Genesis 1 and 1 through 6. So here is your homework. Ah. Homework. Your homework is to read Genesis 1 through 10. This is your homework. to read Genesis one through 10. That's what God said, give you that. So we will, we will read Genesis one through 10. This is the beginning. We're in the Old Testament. Now you can read it with that whatever Bible is good for you. Okay. So we're learning about um, the beginning. We're learning about um, how does Satan get in the earth? We're learning about the power that the enemy has, which is none over God. And we're learning that the fact that God created us. Okay. And the most important thing today is the seed, all right? The seed is Christ. I don't think we really um, tuned in on that, the fact that seed, that Christ is the seed. We'll go into that um, next week. We'll get into that a little bit. And then after we go into that, um, we'll just um, try and wrap up um, Genesis, all right? And so what you have to understand is that um, 
I'm going to do this. It's just so you have an understanding right now. Let me see here. So I feel like, let's see here. All right. I want to bring this stuff up right here. Give me one second. My computer is going so slow. And I'm supposed to have the best internet. All right. So what I want to show you before we before we go is I want to show you this over here. These are the books of the Bible. And it's showing you the books of the Bible. I'm going to break it down in three. From Genesis all the way to this right here. From Genesis to Malachi. From Genesis, I don't want to say Malachi. Let's say from Genesis all the way to Psalms. This deals with the beginning of man, God establishing man as a people in a city, them getting kings to rule over them. So it's like this. Let's say, for instance, we take Virginia. Virginia was the original, one of the original founding states of the United States. For, Virgin, for Virginia to be an actual state, it had to be incorporated. Incorporation means that they've established themselves as a legal place. So from Genesis all the way to, let's say, Ezra, they were established as a legal people. So God took a handful of people. It may have been a million people in the world. And God took 500,000 of them and put them in a land that they own and legalized them and in, like incorporate, incorporated them. So like, let's say he took 500,000 people, just set them in Virginia and incorporated them. That represents the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God established them as a people. Then what he did is he said, okay, I legalize you as a people and I put my stamp on you. Now I got to give you a whole bunch of laws. And now I got to give you somebody that's your ruler and your judge. So then you get, after the first five books of the Bible, you get to Joshua, Judges, Ruth, all of these and Kings and Ezra, all of these are basically about, um, those books are about um, leadership, the people that God chose to lead the people that are in Virginia. You get it? I believe you get it. All right. And so then, then what we have in the middle is we have a lot of different stories. All right. We know that Ruth is a story about a woman who met this man and we know that um, Nehemiah is a story about how they prophesied and um, Psalms is the love story between um, King, um, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. We wrapping up, all right? And so in the middle, you have all of these prophets. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation. All of these people are prophets that were sent to the people in Virginia to get them to do right because they wasn't doing right, all right? A lot of sin was there. And so then after that, the people still wouldn't do right after God, that's what the prophet does. They send a warning to say, hey, you know, you're, you're not, God created you in Virginia, but 
you know, you you having orgies and everything. There's nothing new. They was having orgies back then. They doing all this stuff. So God sent the prophet to try to warn them. They still would listen. So then God said, okay, I'm going to send my son. And so the book of Isaiah, which is in the middle, prophesied that a savior was coming, which is the Messiah. All right. And because the Messiah was coming, um, that they had to understand and know that because the Messiah was coming, stay with me here, because the Messiah was coming, I'm just going to do it like this. I'm sorry. I know this looks very unprofessional, but the Messiah was coming, which is right here. He's going to send a new promise. He's going to send something new, which represents the Holy Spirit. He's going to send a new covenant. Because the old covenant wasn't doing it for y'all. All right. So now I'm going to go back over to this Bible. And we find out that a Messiah is coming. The Messiah comes in the book of Matthew. That's the New Testament. So we've already broke down two. If you think it beginning, middle, and end. The beginning is the middle is the beginning of the people in Virginia, maybe 500,000 people. God said, do right. It started with Adam and Eve. They messed everything up. God said, okay, we're going to fix it from here. I want you to do right, do right by me. They still couldn't get it right. So then God said, well, I'm going to send something to make it so that you, it, it never, it never, it's never broken anymore. So then in the book of Matthew, he sends his son, all right? And then that's when you get into um, Christianity. And so from Matthew all the way to the book of Acts, we learn about Christ coming and his resurrection. And we learn about the Holy Spirit that he leaves with us, which is our helper and our God. And so then after that, you have what are called the 13 letters or the 13 epistles, which began with Romans all the way down to the book of third John. And these are basically letters that Paul wrote to the church because when Christ came, he established a church after he resurrected in the book of Acts, the church was a, a started, the Christian church. And Paul was one of the leaders of the Christian church. Paul and Peter and John, you know, all of them, the 12 disciples. And Paul wrote these letters to the church to encourage the people. It's like if I will write a letter to encourage you. So then that represents Romans all the way down to third John. All right. And then we have Revelations. So Revelations is basically the book where there are visions. Some of this stuff in Revelations has not happened yet. A lot of it is visions, all right? And that's the end. God is showing what the end is going to be like, amen? So I wanted to give you that breakdown of the Bible. Now, when we come back together, we're gonna to talk about the prophets. We're gonna talk about the kings. Just remember that God created a people in Genesis and set them in another state, which was Jerusalem, but we're just calling it Virginia. And he incorporated them and he called them the Israelites. Okay. It will be the same thing if we call people the Virginians. All right. They had a name called the Israelites. All right. And next week, we're going to get into the 12 tribes of Israel, and we're going to get into that seed of Christ, all right? I love you so much. If doesn't anybody have any more questions, I would say that this concludes um, our class on the day. Amen. Are there any more, are there any more questions that um, anyone may, may have? Amen. I want to make sure we don't have any questions. You know, if you do have something that you think about, um, after we hang up, because there's going to be time between today and next week, uh, just just shoot me the questions and we'll go over them in the class. I love you so much. 
If you feel like or you feel led to sow a free will offering, um, you can do so. I'm so excited. We're getting ready to move into our new church. Amen. So whatever you can do, if you're able to do it, go ahead and do it. That's right. This was some good teaching. Amen. And I give God all the credit. I'm going to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this word was not taken away as soon as it was sown. Heavenly Father, I pray for clarity and understanding. Father God, I thank you because there is a leap inside of the people's bellies. They are excited, God. I'm excited. Oh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we're going to learn so much about your Bible and what it means and where we've come from and where we're going. God is saying, just to read, just to remember, the people made a mistake. God corrected the mistake. And then God is going to glorify the mistake. Meaning that you made a, we made a mistake in Genesis with Adam and Eve. God sent his son to correct the mistake. And then in the end, the mistake will be glorified because there will be a new heaven. There'll be a new earth. The Bible says that the doors of heaven will always stay open. There will be a new earth. God is going to get rid of the old earth and he's going to put a new earth here. My God, can you imagine what the new, how beautiful the new earth is going to be? And the people that have made it into God's kingdom will live on the new earth. There will be a new earth. Amen. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. I love you. May, um, can we revisit? Can we revisit this lesson? Uh, yeah, we'll revisit this lesson. We'll recap. We'll recap our uh, next week. Uh, we'll recap. But um, God said he made a he made a new earth. I just want to give you this one scripture that says that God says that there will be a new earth. This will help you understand the corruptible versus the new the versus the incorruptible okay that's going to be found in genesis where it says he says i john saw a new heaven and i saw a new earth and so that's going to be write this scripture down okay and then i'm going to let you all go all right it's revelations the 21st chapter let me let me let me bring this up to just real quick I know you guys got to go, but just real quick, all right? And then I'm going to let you go, all right? So um, the Bible says, um, this will help you understand in the name of Jesus, amen? It says, Revelations 21, hallelujah, and verse one. See that there? Revelations 21 and one. And I saw a new heaven, and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. All right. So that glorious state, that place where what Jesus looked like on that mountain is what's going to live in the new heaven and a new earth. And that's what you're going to take on a new body. So, Father God, we thank you that we're going to be turned into angels. We're going to be like angels. Father God, we thank you for clarity and understanding. God said in the beginning, we made a mistake. God sent his son to fix the mistake. And at the end, the mistake is going to be fixed permanently. Fixed, corrected permanently with an incorruptible body. God, I lift you up and I glorify you and I exalt you. Keep these people in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you and I'll see you the next time. Okay? All right. Bye-bye.